Alrighty, we're gonna do a motorcycle a uh, little bit of a study here I guess you could call it first one I've done of these so I have no idea how the audio is going to turn out or the video or anything else i um, going to talk a little bit about why I no longer go to church okay what made me stop going to church all right now let me start out by saying that I am not a novice um, I am not some kind of a disgruntled Christian that doesn't know the Bible or whatever, blah, 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 you know. I am, I've been in full-time ministry now for 10 years. I was trained by some of the best Bible-believing preachers um, in the world at the time when I studied. Uh, I still study, I still read the Bible, King James Bible, quite a bit. Um, and so, you know, I know people are going to try to put on me that I'm an amateur, or that I'm just some kind of a disgruntled church hopper whatever not happy with things and uh, by the way I'm in northern Maine right now if you're wondering um, and uh, but anyhow uh, so why did I leave the church why did I stop going to church well uh, the biggest reason is because of the two lives that are lived by church going people you have people that go to church and they do certain things and they act in certain ways when they're inside the church and then they leave quote unquote the church and then they they act a different way and I've seen that thing uh, I've done it myself so I was just as big a hypocrite as anybody else and why well because you separate uh, going to church and being in church from your regular life and that's a real problem uh, of course, the New Testament teaches that the church is a living group of people. It is not a building. Never in the New Testament are you going to see a time when the Christians are building church buildings and uh, attending them and inviting the lost to them, you know, and having revival meetings and spaghetti dinners and the whole deal. <laughs> okay, that's, that's not a New Testament practice. All right, that's very important to understand that. And you say, well, what about the synagogues? Well, the Jews... The early Christians were Jews, and so they would go to the synagogue because it was their custom at the time, and, and the book of Acts, you see, is a transitional book. And so they would go to the synagogue, but look what was happening when they would go. They were being kicked out. They were being put in prison for going there and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It would be the same thing today if you went into a Jewish synagogue and tried to preach Jesus Christ. Um, you would have the same issue. Okay, you would be treated the same way in other words all right uh, see where my trail is here yep this is the one I'm not gonna be riding real aggressively today or anything uh, just kind of enjoying the day here but um, so you see from the Bible that there is not one verse of scripture that says go to church and that's kind of a shock to a lot of people. They, they think, what? That can't be. That can't just can't be. Yes, it can be, and it is. Um, nobody has ever, ever told to go to church. Uh, not one verse of Scripture. And again, you know, I was raised in church buildings. I was raised going, and it was always a, you know, at first I would kind of like it because the Sunday school was nice, and they had games, and they had candy that they'd give us and whatever. And I'm talking back in the, you know, late 70s, early 80s. I'm 43 years old right now. So I've been around a little while. And, um, you know, uh, back then it was not nearly as liberal as it is today. It was a fairly conservative church that I went to. Calvary Monument Independent, or Calvary Monument Bible Church, excuse me. It was an independent Bible church. And uh, so anyhow... Um, but I started to see some things, and I saw a lot of the, the clickiness of the church building. I saw a lot of the, a lot of the, um, oh, you're friends with so-and-so. Oh, well, you know, and, and I started to see how certain families would kind of not associate with other families. And, um, you know, and I just kind of thought, well, that's, I guess, the way it is and whatever. And, and you know, we were encouraged to read the Bible. 
And the problem was I'd read the Bible and I'm saying I don't see these practices in there as far as, you know, going to church and, you know, just the, the little clickiness that's created from going to these church buildings. I don't see this. Where's this stuff at? And, um, but, I, you know, you learn not to ask questions as a child. And if you do ask questions, usually you're shot down pretty quickly. And, oh, we don't know, but, you know, don't ask a question. Just shut up and sit there and recite your memory verses well that works for a while but of course I got to be a teenager and by the time I got to be a teenager um, I started having more questions and and uh, was working a secular job and they started saying hey can you work on Sunday you know we know you don't like to do that but so-and-so is sick and we're really in a bind here you know we we need somebody to come in and work and you're the only one that can fill this position can you come in and of course, you know, at first it was no, I can't do that. It's Sunday. I can't work on a Sunday, the whole deal. And after a while, it was, well, sure, why not? And I tell my parents, you know, hey, I, I'm driving, you know, here, and and uh, you know, they need me at my job. And um, so I started skipping out on going to church. And uh, as time went by, I stopped going altogether obviously um, and it wasn't always because I was working either I just you know didn't feel like going and I just got sick and tired of it another thing had happened around that time the time I was a teenager um, the church building that I was raised in uh, they built on they had this big building program you know like they do and they got to get all these you know got to build a million dollar building to save more souls according to them and um, and so the, you know, the, the building changed and the people changed as a result. It was a country, little country church type of thing. It was pretty big. It was about 300 members, I think. But, you know, when it got bigger, it got mirrored walls and crystal chandeliers and the whole deal. All of a sudden, it attracted a new group of people. And I'm going to this church building where I was raised. And um, I'm having people coming up to me and saying, oh, is this your first Sunday here? I'm going, uh, I was dedicated as a baby at this church, you know, long before you ever showed up. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I just, I didn't know, you know, yeah, okay, whatever. And uh, I remember going to one Sunday and and uh, I remember I went in shortly before the thing, the service started and this other kid, he was a farm kid and uh, was a year, a couple years behind me and as far as grade is concerned and, and him and his, his wife came and uh, they wouldn't let them into the sanctuary because the service had started and they, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't open the doors to the sanctuary because it would disturb the service. And uh, I remember he, he yelled at the guy and stormed off and caused a scene, you know. And I, I guess I, I stopped going shortly after that myself because it was just getting ridiculous. But uh, for many, many years, um, you know, for many years I just... I thought to myself, you know what, this is, this is pointless. I'm just going, it's a social club, and, you know, what's the point? What's the point of me going, you know? Um, I really wasn't reading the Bible. I, I would read the Bible, and it would seem so foreign to me, and I thought, I don't really have anything in common with these people. It's just this ancient book, and I was even reading an IV at that point in time, New International Version. I wasn't even reading a King James Bible, and... Uh, you know, so there was nothing there about, make sure my camera's still there, yep. <laughs> um, I gotta remember, I got another couple inches on top of my head here with the camera. But, you know, I knew nothing about the Bible version issue. I knew, I knew nothing about, uh, you know, God's standards of holiness or, or sin or, or sanctification. Or, I, I had no idea. And I was a professing Christian the whole time. You know, people come up to me and say, hey, are you saved? Oh, of course I'm saved. I'm going to heaven when I die. I prayed a prayer back when I was a little boy in Sunday school. So, yeah, I'm going to heaven. I've, you know, I went to church. I don't go all the time. I'm no saint, you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Of course I'll go to heaven when I die. I'm not a heathen or anything. And I was the whole time. So, what happened? Well, got into the art world and uh, I guess about in my 
early 20s, I was a real motorhead and, and um, you know, just loved motorcycles like crazy. And, and I'm still, you know, I still love motorcycles. I'm on one right now, obviously. Uh, grew up on motorcycles. First, first started riding when I was 10 years old. So, um, you know, uh, never really grew out of it. But just priorities changed over the years. And uh, salvation changed, obviously, as well. But I really, I was pretty much just living as a secular person, a secular man in my early 20s. And uh, just adrenaline, all adrenaline, you know, see how fast I can go, see how far I can jump, see how big a hill I can climb, see, you know, whatever. It was just adrenaline. I had a Corvette at that time and an uh, old uh, Ford truck with a big block in it and, you know, and a real fast truck, 69 Ford truck. You can watch my vehicle testimony if you want to see the pictures of all of it. But um, that was my life. That was everything. You know, we'd people would always joke me because we'd be going, we'd be going along, and and uh, I'm not going through mud today because I got decent clothes on. I don't want to get the bike all filthy either. But uh, anyhow, getting back to what I was saying. Um, my, my life was about machines. My life was about materialism. It was about things. And, uh, you know, just, I, I got into the art world and started to, you know, put my work in art galleries and things. And, and uh, that was it. I mean, that was just everything. But I was missing something big time in my life, and I knew it. And I was just, you know, the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> what a miserable thing. And um, I'll get back to that here in a little bit. Let me, well, I guess I'll just continue talking. Might as well. Got to go up the road a little ways here. quite a bit of driving on this road here so I don't know if I'll be heard because of the wind but uh, I'll just keep on talking if I have to do a voiceover I'll do a voiceover but um, needless to say my life was going nowhere fast and I noticed that every time I get a new motorcycle or a fast car or whatever else I would feel that little bit of happiness and a little bit of fulfillment and purpose in life and uh, it would last for a little while. I'd go show my buddies my new vehicle or go out cruising with it or racing people, going fast. And then the new would wear off and I'd go and I'd get something else. And uh, just one right after another is all it was. Just another vehicle and another vehicle and another vehicle. And then with my art shows, at, you know, at art galleries, um, you know, another art gallery, another, another, art show, uh, you know, getting into better galleries, and it just, just things, 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 things. What did it mean? So, I remember one night being outside of my wood shop, where uh, I would make my work, and I just, uh, I walked outside and I said, God, I know you're real. Uh, I don't, I have no idea if I'm a Christian, I have no idea, but uh, I want to know the truth. And when I said I want to know the truth, there wasn't a bit of hypocrisy in my request at all. I wanted the truth. And I didn't care what it cost. I didn't care what it meant. I didn't, I, just nothing. I just wanted to know the truth. What is the life? What is, what's the purpose of life? What's, you know, whatever. Where, where do I find joy? Well, you know, what am I here for? And uh, that's what began it. And, um, and a short while later, I started to, uh, I was a big TV movie guy, and so I started watching television, and uh, at the time John Hagee, which I am repulsed by that man now, he's a wicked false prophet, but at the time, he was talking about Bible prophecy, and how we're in the end times, and I thought, huh, you know, 
because you know to me the world was all out in the future boy I mean I was gonna grow old and have grandchildren and great-grandchildren the whole deal and I I wasn't thinking about the end of the world or anything and so I thought to myself huh you know the Bible I guess says that there's some kind of an end times and we're in it and oh boy you know and so that really kind of opened up something and and then another big thing was uh, Kent Hovind had an older brother gave me Ken Hoven videotapes, the old uh, VHS tapes, it was back before they had DV DVDs, it tells you how long ago it was, and uh, you know, I thought Ken Hoven was great at the time, and I've since learned out the guys, uh, the whole point of, you know, uh, Dr. Dino, the, uh, what do you call it, Creation Science Evangelism, CSC Ministries, the whole point of it, according to the court affidavit, was for the ecumenical movement, joining of Catholics and Protestants together. So Ken Hovind's a traitor, he's a, he's a fake. Uh, I found that out, unfortunately, about a lot of people over the years. Uh, not because I look for it, but because it just shows up and I say, okay, what am I gonna do about it? Remember my prayer? I prayed, Lord, I want the truth, no matter what it costs. And Lord gave me truth. And so, um, So anyhow, so uh, thinking where this goes, the uh, another thing that happened in that around that time period was I went on a mission trip to Honduras to a little town called La Acequia, and uh, I saw how people in a third world country live, the poverty that's there, the just, I mean, my word, people living in just such squalor and just so poor, and uh, and they were on the edge of a big Chiquita banana field big plantation and they're all plantation workers and I got to see what an oligarchy is firsthand you get this you know these rich Americans going down there just using the people for slave labor essentially I think they're making about 10 to 20 dollars a month down there and I am not exaggerating this would have been uh, probably about late 1990s maybe year 2000 somewhere in there I don't remember some of the dates you know a lot of that stuff is just slipped my mind over the years so many other things have entered in you know learned so much other truth but uh, so you know I come back to America and I'm going okay what am I left with here I just saw that there are people that are so poor that they can barely afford food you know just living in, in these little wooden shacks with newspapers for partition walls inside and just wretchedly poor and I'm gonna come back to America and and uh, you know hit it big and get rich and I just thought I don't want to even do that I just I lost all my desire for the art world at that point in time and uh, I was starting to learn about Bible prophecy and, and creation science and I thought you know what there's something here that I I want to know more this is this truth that I've been looking for and so I started to study and uh, I remember I started to get into um, some of Bill Schneblin's stuff, William J. Schneblin, on the Freemasonry and the the uh, exposing the Illuminati from within, and and uh, you know witchcraft, Wicca, and all this stuff. And I started to study on that stuff, some of the occult, and I was kind of shocked at how much of that stuff I actually had dabbled with in my teenage years, um, pretty much ignorantly. And uh, so that was kind of an interesting, very eye-opening type of a deal. And so after that, uh, I found out about Peter Ruckman. I was starting to get into the King James Bible issue and I had bought uh, Sam Gipp's answer book and Gail Ripplinger's New Age Bible versions. And um, my older brother, oldest brother, handed me a copy of James White's book, The King James Only Controversy. And I read it and I thought, man, this guy's got all kinds of problems. I mean, I could see it and I wasn't even you know, I was, I, I guess I would have been saved at that time, I mean, I, but I wasn't really grounded in the faith, you know, I was just, you know, fairly newly saved, and I, you know, looking back, I know that it was the devil that had my brother try to give me that book and try to sway me away from the Word of God, but I was just too, you know, I knew what I wanted, I wanted truth, and I knew that the truth was not in the NIV that I had been using for 15 years, you know, of my life, and so, uh, at that point in time, and because um, I got it when I was 10 years old for Christmas, I got an NIV, uh, New Schofield, or not a, no, it was a, um, 
Riley Study Bible, I guess, NIV. And um, I knew that the thing was corrupt and, and whatever. I had seen enough. And James White wasn't, wasn't really answering those questions and things. And I thought, yeah, this guy's a snake. But that was the very first time I ever read a Peter Ruckman quote was from James White's book. And I kept hearing this name Peter Ruckman showing up. And I thought, well, I'd like to find out who this Peter Ruckman guy is. So I, I, uh, I guess I got online and did some searching and found some of his stuff, ordered a few of his videos. Um, can't remember who I bought. I guess maybe it was Gail Ripplinger, yeah. AV Publications, she sold a few of Ruckman's uh, VHS tapes. Him debating, a, was it Earl Calland or something? Calland, uh, that one, and then a couple other things from Ruckman. And that was the first time I ever saw any of Ruckman's material. And uh, after that, I started buying a lot more of his stuff, his books, his videos, his audio tapes, cassette tapes, again, showing how far back we're talking here. And, uh, I mean, they had CDs at that point, but they the, they skipped, you know, the audio cassette tapes and, and went to MP3. They weren't going to do the audio CDs. But anyhow, so uh, that's how that whole thing went. And so I was just learning so much Bible from Peter Ruckman and from a lot of other guys, a lot of other great preachers at the time. And uh, I actually, you know, decided that I was going to start going to church again. And I thought, you know, now I know the Bible and, and you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot of stuff and I'm learning, I just was devouring as much information as I could. And so I thought, well, Peter Ruckman's a Baptist, so I'll just find a good Baptist church to go to and they'll believe just what Peter Ruckman believes. They believe the King James Bible's God's word from cover to cover, like Ruckman says. And I thought, well, that'll be great. Praise the Lord, I can get involved, you know, and, and just start going out and doing uh, soul winning type of things. and. And, you know, just really devote myself to some church building someplace. And so, um, down in um, Lidditz, Pennsylvania, I guess is where the address would be. There was a church, Brubaker Valley Road, I think it was, called um, Cornerstone Baptist Church. Dr. Arnold Killinger was the pastor at the time. He since uh, left his wife. And um, I don't know what he's doing now, but he's probably not in ministry anymore but at the time he seemed you know legitimate <laughs> I thought but um, so anyhow so I started going there and you know faithfully attending and I went in and I remember I had jeans and t-shirt not a t-shirt but just kind of a decent shirt on and I saw a lot of the men had suits and ties so I went to a Goodwill and I got a suit and tie you know I wasn't going to go buy a brand new one or nothing but I went and I bought a my first suit and tie and and uh, just really got fervent and um, talking to Arnold Killinger there, the pastor, and, and um, just wanted to talk about the Bible all the time, you know, and, and I saw a lot of people there at Cornerstone Baptist Church were not really uh, interested in the things of the Lord. They just really didn't want to talk, but I thought, well, that's okay, you know, there some Baptists aren't, just aren't as, quite as fervent as I am, or as others are. I didn't know. <laughs> and. Um, one of the deacons there was a man named Chuck Taft. And Chuck Taft, uh, I made the mistake the one time of making fun of the NIV in front of him, thinking he's a Baptist, he's a deacon in a Baptist church, he's got to be a King James Bible-believing Christian. Boy, was I mistaken. And uh, his face turned bright red, and he said, some of the best professors I know use NIVs. You know, I, I went to Bible college and, and some fine men of God used the NIV. It's a good Bible. It's nothing wrong with it. King James onlyism is dangerous. Okay, all right. So, <clears throat> I thought, well, um, this is kind of weird. So, I started to, you know, notice that there were some people in the uh, church there that didn't quite believe the way that uh, I believed and uh, according to the scriptures. And uh, in process of time, I was able to teach a Sunday school class on the Bible version issue there. And um, well, I got some nasty looks from some of the people in the congregation. And I started thinking again, huh, you know, I thought I was in a Baptist church here. I thought, you know, all Baptist churches believe the King James Bible. Well, showed how naive I was, because uh, no, they certainly do not. And uh, so, 
little while after that, I, I just got to a point where I realized I'm not going to be able to stay here. They don't really believe the King James Bible. Found out Arnold Killinger wasn't a Bible believer. He was a Texas Receptus guy and believed the King James Bible had errors in it and that it was wrong and sinful to call the King James Bible God's perfect word. So, okay, yeah, time to leave. After that, I went to uh, Mount Zion, ba or not Mount Zion, after that it would have been Berean Bible Church and um, Kelly Sensening. And I have a whole video on him on my secondary channel. Um, and he doesn't believe the King James Bible either. And I remember I brought up the name of Peter Ruckman and he just started laughing and said, oh yeah, yeah, Ruckman, yeah. <laughs> That guy, yep. He didn't really say a whole lot. He just kind of, yeah, yeah, Ruckman, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with his work. <laughs> and uh, and I saw that, that when he would stand up in the pulpit on Sunday morning as Kelly Sensnick, he would say, now the Greek word here is such and such, and it should be better translated as, and he would give another word. So he's correcting the King James Bible from the pulpit. But the problem was, uh, being a former NIV user, I knew that when he was correcting the King James Bible with his quote-unquote Greek text, he was actually correcting it and changing the words to the NIV reading. And I went, uh-oh, I think I got another snake here. And I most certainly did. And he still was a snake to this very day. Um, my parents actually attend his wicked little Babel building there. Um, <clears throat> the man's a snake. So from there, um, I tried another Baptist church or two, and, and then my parents, I guess, had left Cornerstone by then, and they were starting to go to a Mount Zion Baptist church in uh, Denver, PA, and so I decided, well, okay, I guess I'll go visit there, and I went there, and the pastor's name was Keith Schweitzer, and, um, you know, I got to talking to him, and, and uh, again, I he was going to teach a whole thing on the Bible version issue, and I offered my help, and gave him a bunch of materials, and you know, different Greek texts and books and whatever else he needed and new versions and and he totally blew the whole thing and, and uh, you know, another big story there. But uh, it went a little while there and I heard that that uh, they were going to have Sunday school and my dad wanted to be in the, one of the Sunday school teachers and they said, in order for you to, you know, be a Sunday school teacher, you're going to have to have a police background check. And at the time, I was starting to understand about 501c3 and government incorporation and that these church buildings are just under government control. So I heard, you know, you got to have a police background check to teach Sunday school. And I thought, whoa, whoa, okay. So that was enough of that. And I stopped going to that place in a hurry. And, um, you know, I believe that judgment is supposed to be within the church for church type positions. Uh, bringing secular authorities in is a very dangerous practice. I think this might be my road up here. So, that was the end of that one. Uh, is this it? No. Okay. So anyhow, <clears throat> so after I left Mount Zion Baptist Church, I went back to the old thing again of, okay, you know, I, I've been to just about every one of them in the area that I knew of, and they were all crooked. I couldn't find a single preacher in the, in the entire lot of churches I visited that actually believed the book he was preaching from. And I thought, well, that's a problem. So I thought, all right, well then there's absolutely no point in me being part of this and, and continuing with this. So I thought, well, I'm just going to stay home. A nice little hawk there. I'm just going to stay home and I'm going to watch Ruckman and I'm going to continue learning on my own because I was learning just so much material and so much information just studying on my own. And I was being fed and I'd go to these church buildings and it was just nothing, you know, just these dead sermons. It just I was just wasting my time. So I thought, all right, well, I started out, you know, my uh, journey as a, as a saved man. I started out, here's the road. I started out as a, you know, staying home, not going to some church building someplace. And, uh, all right, there's a good road here. 
and I started out, you know, not going to church someplace, so I'll keep doing that. So, um, <clears throat> for, I'd say probably a year or so, I guess it was, that uh, I just stayed home, and I watched videos, and I listened to sermons, and I'd go online, and I'd get audio sermons from different preachers, and and uh, just, just studying the Bible, just non-stop. And, uh, I guess about a year later, an old friend that I had met, met at uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church many years before that, um, he showed up one day and he said, hey man, he said, you got to go to this church I found. It's called uh, Liberty Baptist Church. And uh, I said, no man, I'm done. You know, I'm, I'm just not into it. And he said, no, there's some real good guys that go there. You got to check it out. You know, they do street preaching and, and uh, you know, there's some real good stuff there. No, 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 no. You know, I, I did the church building thing, brother. I'm done. And uh, <clears throat> finally he talked me into it, and I visited, and, and uh, there's some good guys there, definitely a good good group of guys. And um, so I started attending there and uh, got real involved, and we went out door to door, and we went street preaching and, you know, the whole thing. And uh, But again, I started seeing this, this church building thing. And I start to see that, you know, the double lives, my voice is shaky, as, as uh, people were living one way, you know, and they go to church and live in another way when they're not in church. And uh, not, you know, not some of the good brethren that were there and that were part of it. They were doing fine, you know. But uh, some of these other people and things, you know, I started to see the hypocrisy again and, and you know, it, at uh, the time, I was a bit of a hypocrite, too. I was doing a lot of things that I shouldn't have been doing, and I knew were wrong, but I just, I couldn't seem to get power over my sin. And, uh, so in process of time, you know, we, uh, started to study, myself and, and my old friend from Cornerstone Baptist, and another brother that was going to Liberty Baptist, uh, we started to study the house church movement. And uh, we started to realize, you know what, I think that, that's the New Testament way. And um, so we started, you know, we left Liberty and we started our house church, Bible Believers Fellowship. And we did that for a few years and um, met my wife. And we were not real sure where we were, where we were going to live. And uh, there was a, a church, Baptist church, up in uh, Eldred, Pennsylvania called Country Chapel Baptist Church and they wanted me to come there and help out with the church and also with they had a store and they wanted me to do the video for them and, and things and make a make my wife would make a website and I'd do the video for their stores promotional videos and things and promotional videos for their church as well and you know and uh, so some of those are still on the... I don't know if any of those are still on the YouTube channel. I don't think so. I think it took them all down. But, but uh, i got a slow guy up here. I'm going to have to pass him. But anyways, so that was that was the last church I went to. And um, we were going there, and, and it was the same thing. It was this double life thing that a lot of people were living. I'd gotten victory over a lot of the sins I'd been struggling with when I was back at Liberty Baptist Church. But... You know, I was seeing the double life thing. I was seeing people that were living one way in church, living another outside of church. And I was thinking, man, what is the deal here? What is, what's going on? And see, that's, that's the big problem with church buildings, which I'll get back to later when I get into some of the other things here. But um, So uh, I was going to do a prophecy conference there at, at uh, Country Chapel Baptist Church. And uh, the, the pastor, he said to me, he took me aside, and he said, Hey, he said, uh, before you get started, I just want to tell you, you know, I'd like you to take it easy on the Catholics. And I just about dropped, my mouth dropped open. I said, okay. And he said, he said, you know, he said, there's some Catholics that are probably going to be coming, and I just don't want to needlessly offend them. You know, and, and that just really shocked me. And I thought, well, my word, I can't say anything bad against the Catholics. Um, you know, that's kind of a big part of Bible prophecy, you know. And, uh, thank you.
So I thought, okay, this isn't so good. And then a little while later, he announced that uh, actually the house that we were living in at the time, that he actually was promising it to his daughter and her husband. Even though I had asked, you know, is anybody in line for the house? Because I'm not going to move here and then we'll have to move again. And, oh, no, no, there's nobody, there's nobody. Well, he lied to me and he admitted to lying to me. But, you know, they wanted our, our help, uh, which was free. You know, they let us stay in the place for free in exchange for our help. So it was both of us, you know, were profiting from it, I guess you could say. But it was a, it was a pretty wretched house that we were staying in. It had no insulation and had a whole lot of other problems. The, the water was terrible in it. It was on top of an old oil well area and the water was yellow. Uh, it, it was just awful. But um, couldn't even wash clothes there in that place because they'd come out yellow. But, uh, so, you know, I ended up having to leave that place, and we left. And uh, my wife and I decided to move here to Maine. And that was back in 2013 that we came up just about this time, just about September or so. And, uh... And so we've been here since 2000. 14 and when we finally moved in January and uh, and you know never looked back and we're so happy to be here in northern Maine but um, so that's why I stopped going to church you say well are you gonna go back in the future absolutely not uh, things have gotten progressively worse make sure there's no trains coming Don't want to get run over by a train. I think they'd win. Um, <laughs> so, but to get into some of the theological reasons why I don't go to church, because uh, this is what's really important. It's not really important what happened to me and people. I get these little, you know, amateur psychiatrists, you know, from church buildings, and they go, "Oh, you were hurt. You were hurt, and that's why you don't go back." No, that's not it at all. I've been hurt by a lot of things. You know, I'm on a dirt bike right now. Um, well, dual sport, that uh, I got hurt quite a few times on motorcycles, okay, hurt bad. I mean, just about knocked unconscious, you know, bad cuts, bad injuries, never broke a bone, but I came very close a number of times. I've been in some real bad accidents, but here I am. Um, pain and hurt does not stop me from doing something that I want to do. If I wanted to go to some church building, you know, I would... Uh, I'd find one and whatever, you know, or or a lot of people were actually trying to get me to start one, you know. I'd be the pastor and they'd come and worship me and the whole deal. Nope, no thank you. You know, I know I could get a church building someplace and I could develop a following and the whole deal. I'm not interested. Uh, I want to preach the Word of God to people without compromise, without having to worry about a mortgage, and uh, that's always been my dream. And that's what I'm doing right now. That's what the Lord's helped me to do. And, uh, but you know, the, the whole thing with the church building deal, uh, people make the argument, they say, well, you know, what's the difference if you meet in a, in a church building or if you meet in a house? You know, it's a good thing to have a, a public place where people can come to and, you know, whatever, and it's more convenient and things. And, and uh, so what? We don't, we don't worship the building, which is a lie. A lot of people do. Um, you know, they go there and it's the holy church and you don't do this, you don't do certain things when you're in that holy church. And show reverence and respect to the house of God. Uh, there's no such scripture that says that. There's no such scripture where a building is called the house of God. Uh, the people are the house of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, what happens, like I said, the most dangerous, insidious thing about church buildings is you think that you can live two different lives. You know, just to give you a little idea of what I was talking about there with the Liberty Baptist Church, I was looking at pornography way back then. I was struggling with pornography. I was a single guy, and and just I was having some real hard times with pornography and looking at that junk. And I believe it's because spiritually because these pagan temples are actually, you know, where they would actually have sex orgies in the in the first century. They're, you know, you look at a, an old uh, temple to the goddess Athena, and you'll see that they look, you know, they're Greek Parthenons. They look very similar to the front of a church building. Um, it's just wicked. And, of course, they say, oh, well, our church building's not a temple to Athena. But it's based on the same architecture. And then you got a obelisk on top of the thing in the form of a steeple. 
an obelisk is an uncircumcised male phallic symbol. You know, it's, it's, but you're okay with doing that and you can worship God there and call that thing the house of God. What an abomination. What a total abomination. But, um, you know, I was looking at this pornography and things, so I was living a double life. Well, see, I didn't look at pornography when I was in church, you see. But when it started to dawn on me after reading the scriptures and studying the scriptures, that I was actually in church all the time. You know, news flash for you there, friend. I'm in church right now. I'm riding a dual sport motorcycle 55 miles an hour down a dirt road in northern Maine, and I'm in church. Okay? <laughs> um, a lot of times when I ride my motorcycle like this, I will be singing hymns and praising and worshiping the Lord. Uh, and it's not somehow, oh, yeah, but you don't, you're not in church. Uh, people have a warped mentality. And again, you know, you, you just, this, this thing of sin, justifying sin, because you're not in church doing it. See, that's my biggest issue with church buildings. You know, I've, I've debated, you know, back and forth with people on this church building issue for many years now, because I came out a long time ago. I'd say probably back in 2009, 2010, I was putting out stuff against church buildings and really coming out hard on them. And um, I was getting a lot of people upset and everything, and I've heard all the arguments back and forth and why you should have them, why they're okay, and the whole deal. I'm very familiar with the attacks. Quite familiar with the attacks, actually. And, um... So, you know, don't don't act like, oh, you know, uh, Brian Nellinger is just, a, he's an idiot and he hasn't considered these points and things. I've, I can I can assure you I've considered your points. Uh, I haven't heard anything new on this whole church building debate now for many, many years. Um, church buildings are social clubs. They are filled with people that live a double life. And, uh, you know, I think if any preacher that's out there would have to admit that the actual faithful people, the ones that are really there and the ones that really love the Lord and study the Bible, um, it's probably in most churches, I'd say, less than 20 people. Most of them under 10 people. And, um, you know, you go to these buildings and, and, of course, you know, again, you're worshiping in some building that you, it's mortgaged to the bank. You've got to make these payments and all this stuff. It's just terrible. And, you know... But you have to go through this mind control thing for a while after you leave. You just, you feel this guilty pressure on you. And it's just, you know, you know, you know people will act like you're not saved and they'll put, your, put you down because you don't go to church on Sunday. And uh, you got to get through that thing. And you got to say to yourself, you know, what's my authority? Is the Word of God my authority? Or is some tradition my authority? Am I supposed to do these things because somebody said it's the right thing to do or whatever else? You know, if the Bible's your final authority, then you just say, well, who cares? I know what the Bible says. I know what the scripture says, and it does not tell me to go to church. It does not tell me to build some building and invite saved and lost people into it. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says not to. You're not to have, you know, you're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You're not to fellowship with the lost. You're to come out from among them and be ye separate, the Bible says. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You're not supposed to be part of lost people in terms of trying to worship the Lord together or something. That's an abomination in God's sight. So, um, my advice to you, you know, if you're still watching this whole thing, is uh, don't ever let yourself get drawn into these church buildings, uh, especially nowadays. I mean, you know, Again, you know, people say, well, did God ever use a church building? Did, you know, God's used, mightily used the church buildings. Uh, God allowed some of that stuff back in the past because there was no, you know, it was kind of compartmentalized. You get people in the church building and you get a pastor that's been trained at some seminary. He ain't going to tell them the truth. He ain't going to say, hey, you don't really need to come here. This is unscriptural what we're doing. We got these practices from the Roman Catholic Church. He ain't going to say that stuff. You know, so... What do you got? Well, you got people that are compartmentalized, and they go and they, like I once did, they they are very well-meaning, and they try to be part of things and whatever else. And but there's just a constant strife, the constant constant division, especially if the preacher's preaching the truth. You can go to, you know, I know again, I know how to to please people in the pulpit. 
I, or excuse me, in the pews, rather, <laughs> from the pulpit to the pew. I understand how to please people. You don't talk about prophecy stuff and say things are getting worse. You, you say things are getting better. You know, you prophesy smooth things. You prophesy nice things. And you get the people in the pews smiling and you, you tell some jokes to kind of get the crowd going. And you listen to preaching, even quote-unquote good Bible-believing preaching. And they, the preachers will do it over and over and over again. They'll tell jokes. They'll get the people going. They'll, they'll laugh and, they, you know, whatever else. I'm not against jokes, but, you know, it's these guys start putting on a show. And then they'll get these sermons that they preach. And they'll just, you know, they'll get 30 or 40 sermons. And then they just go from church to church to church preaching the same junk. You know, maybe adding a little bit to it. But they just got this folder of sermons that they can go... Oh, this is a good one. You know, this is a good. This is a good one from the old sermon barrel. You'll hear him say that. You know, again, what is this? Is is this something that I have to feel guilty because I'm not part of it? I don't think so. I don't think so. And they say, well, but Brian, who are you accountable to? Uh, you forget that I'm accountable to God, right? If the Lord's not pleased with me, He's going to take me down a notch. If the Lord's not pleased with me, you know, my words, my speech are not going to line up with His word. You're going to look in there and you're going to say, hey, wait a second here. Here's a verse that says go to church. Here's a verse that says First Baptist Church or Sunday best or kneel down at the altar and come forward now. And, you know, you're going to find that stuff. You're going to say, well, Denlinger's wrong. He's, he's some kind of cult guy or something like this. You know, you won't find my speech, you know, matching the scriptures. But when you find my speech matching the scriptures and you can't refute my arguments, then you are the one that needs to change, not me. That's the whole issue here. And, you know, oh, but brother, we got to stick by these traditions. we got to stand by the old stuff, brother. Well, you know, it's funny because the old stuff, the oldest Baptist church in America was built in 1700. Why weren't there any Baptist churches before then? You say, well, Roger Williams is the first Baptist. Roger Williams rejected church buildings. Roger Williams was an Anglican preacher who actually, you know, was kicked out of the Anglican system. And, uh... They, you know, put him out in the winter trying to hope to kill him. And I think the Native American people helped him out and stuff. But he went up there to Rhode Island, called the area Providence, you know, because God led him there. But Roger Williams rejected church buildings. Roger Williams worshipped out in the woods, you know. And a lot of the early preachers, uh, they were very much against the thing of, of worshipping in some pagan building. They called them, a lot of times they called them steeple houses. You know, they didn't want to call them a church. So, you know, it's just, when you study the whole thing, you realize how absurd it is. And, you know, you say, well, well, you know, is it okay to go to church for the fellowship? Well, what's your fellowship based on? Is it based on worldly things? Or are you standing around talking about the Bible? Most church buildings I've ever been to, it's they're standing around talking about the weather and talking about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and and you know the, their new gun that they just got or whatever whatever they're talking about things of the world and you start talking too much about the bible and people start saying you're weird but i got to be part of that huh uh, i don't think so so you know if you're you know watching this thing and you don't know for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die if you're not really you don't know if you're saved if you're a real christian or not well, you know, you can get that thing figured out too. I can get into that a little bit more later, but, you know, I just want to say this. You don't need to go to church, right? Um, I'm not against Christians fellowshipping together, by the way. Let me say that. Uh, I know that there are Christians that meet in public places and they're, and they're fine people and whatever else, and, you know, they'll meet at some, you know, I don't want to say town hall, but a community center or something like that in their area, and they'll have a little Bible study or something. I'm not against that. I'm not against that at all. You know, what I'm against is I'm against people with this this system. When you set up that two-part system where you have your life in church and your life outside of the church, that's what I'm against. That's what I speak against. And I'm also against, you know, yoking yourself up to the secular government and saying I'm under uh, Section 501c3 of the tax code here in America, which means that you are a government corporation. And I'm not making that up, you know. Uh, you're, you go into a 501c3 church, um, you are literally standing on federal government property in that place. Now that should scare you. 
Um, when you have the government and the church yoking up together, you have a major problem there. That's not good. There's another big clear-cut area here from the wonderful mechanized logging in this area. You know, they'll, they'll, I guess they, they purposefully clear-cut it. You can see some of the little trees they planted there. But, you know, it just some of this logging in this area is just atrocious. But uh, getting back to what I'm saying here, um, you know, I just I get sick and tired of this pressure that's put on people that uh, you have to go to church or you're somehow, you know, less of a Christian or something stupid like that. Uh, that's nonsense. Um, again, you know, Jesus Christ was not into people, you know, elevating their traditions above scripture and we shouldn't be either you know it's a, it's a dangerous practice of you know the Roman Catholics are very much into that thing they make the Word of God of none effect by their tradition and uh, it's, it's just it's dangerous very 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 dangerous to get into that man it's getting muddy and very slippery I don't exactly have the best you know dual sport tires don't have the knobbies that offer a dirt bike still things are a little slippery there So, um, but what is salvation? I'll just cover that. If somebody's watching this and they, don't, you know, you're not saved, or you, you say, "Well, I was raised in church buildings," and honestly, I have no idea. You know, I have no feelings of relation to the people in the Bible. I don't go through what they went through. I, it just is a, it's like reading a dead book to me. Well, make sure you're using a King James Bible because that's the living Word of God. The others are, others are from the Vatican. Um, they're from the Nestle's text primarily, and and that goes back to the Vatican. Um, it's a cursed text. It's an Egyptian text, not a Syrian text like that of the King James Bible, the received text that underlies the King James Bible primarily. But anyhow, um, make sure you're using a King James Bible. That's very important. But uh, um, when it comes to salvation, you, know, you say, okay, what do you mean? What is salvation? How do you be saved? Well, salvation, if I said right now I need salvation on my motorcycle, You'd say, huh? Um, what are you talking about? You don't need to be saved on that bike. You're just cruising down that road there. You're, you're doing just fine. Everything's okay. What do, you, what do you mean you need to be saved? Well, what if I go up here a little ways? I hope this doesn't happen, but I <laughs> hope I'm not prophesying things. But I go up here a little ways, and I just lose it in the stones, and I go fly off the edge of the road here and down into a, a big ravine, and, and I'm laying down there, and i got a broken leg. There's no way I can walk. My arm's broken. The bike is just totally totaled and just ruined, and uh, I have nothing I can do. I'm laying there helpless, and I'm hurt bad, and I know I'm going to die, and I and I know I deserve to die. It was nobody's fault but my own. I was, I was the one who went too fast into the corner. I was the one that did something stupid, so I can't blame anybody but myself. I'm laying there in the bottom of that ravine, and I'm hurt bad, and I need help. What do I do? I just sit there and say... I'm just going to take a nap because, you know, somebody will eventually find me. I don't need to, to do anything or whatever else. Of course not. If you have any common sense, you know, I'd be laying there. I'd say, help, help. I'd start yelling at the top of my lungs. I'd listen for a car going by. I'd start screaming, yelling, trying to do whatever I could to get somebody's attention. Why? Because I need to be saved. You understand? Now, here's how it works out. You mess your life up. As a lost person, you get into the world and you get into bad relationships and you get into bad jobs and you get into, you just rip, make a wreck of your life and you're wrecked finally. You're just there and you're crashed. Your, your relationships are falling apart. Your health is falling apart. Everything is just messed up and you're just going, oh boy, what is the point? You know, what is, what in the world? How did I get to this point in life? Well, you need to be saved. You see? You can't do it yourself. You're laying there. You're broken. You're you're messed up. You get that? You're broken. You know, like my little analogy with a broken bone. You're broken. I need to be saved. Well, you need somebody that's stronger than you. That's somebody that's that's better than you to come along and help you. Well, in salvation, in terms of salvation, you say I'm broken. I can't fix myself. I've tried to reform my life. I've tried to give up the alcohol or the cigarettes or the pornography or the bad relationships, the fornication, the, the drugs, or whatever else you're into. 
I've tried and I just can't. I just keep wrecking. I just keep messing up. You know? Well, then what can you do? you got to find somebody else that's, that's uh, better than you. That knows how to help you. That can save you. And that person is Jesus Christ. See, you can't say, well, I'm going to go to church and things. Well, what if you find the wrong church? What if they preach the wrong gospel? And they do all the time. You know? They're not going to help you. You have to find Jesus Christ and you have to say, you have to call upon the name of the Lord. You say, God, I don't know what in the world I'm going to do. I sure have messed my life up. I'm wrecked. I'm just ruined. I screwed my life up here. I've just, uh, my marriage is in, in a shambles. If, if you're even married or maybe you've, you know, gotten a divorce or whatever else. I just messed my life all up. God, I need help. I can't, I'm just laying here broken. I can't even move anymore. I'm not even going to try to get up and get back on this bike and try to run again. I'm, I know I'm just going to wreck again. I know I'm just going to mess up again. Well, you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You call upon him and you say, God, can you please save me? I need help with this sinful life that I have. I need, I need help getting away from this stuff. I can't do it on my own. And then you read in the Bible where it says that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. See, he'll help you. He'll help you change your life. He'll help you reform your life. But more importantly than that, he died on the cross almost 2,000 years ago to pay for your sins. All right, you say pay for them. Well, I, I don't understand what that means. Well, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. See, you disobeyed the law. You know, if I would speed here someplace, not on this road, but if... If I would speed and get busted and the, the police officer hands me a fine and I look at the fine and I say, oh, I can't pay that. I don't have the money for that. And the police officer says, well, that's not my problem, pal. You disobeyed the law. You disobeyed the speed limit and I caught you. Okay? You, you transgressed the law and you've been caught and now you have to pay. But you say, well, I can't pay. I don't have that kind of money. And all of a sudden somebody taps you on the shoulder and they say, I'll pay it. I'll take care of that that uh, traffic ticket there, that, that speeding fine. I'll take care of it, friend. You know what you would do? You would say, oh, buddy, uh, buddy I owe you. You know, I don't know who you are, but, but uh, tell me who you are. I'd, I'd like to pay you back. Certainly. i got to stand up a little bit. My, uh, uh, I'm getting a little sore from riding on these roads. Um, <clears throat> but that's Jesus Christ, friend. That's a picture of Jesus Christ. He comes along and he says, I'll pay that fine for you. The wages of sin is death. Okay, you've earned it. You've earned death. You've earned eternity and hell. But guess what? I'll pay that fine for you. He died on the cross. He shed his blood to pay for your sins. Paid in full. He said, what do I do? got to do to get that? Well, come to him in an, in an act of faith and say, you know what? I'm a sinner. God, I know that. I've wrecked my life. I know that I'm worthy of death. I know that I have a big fine above me <laughs> that i got to pay, and I can't pay it. So I believe that that death that you died on the cross, I put my faith in that. And uh, that death that you died, Lord, I want, to, that, I want that to be my payment for sin. Whoa. And you put your faith in that, that death. And you say, just the death? Well, the burial and resurrection. See, if Jesus just died on the cross, well, what would it mean? It wouldn't mean anything. <laughs> He'd be like anybody else. He'd be like Buddha or Muhammad or... Confucius or anybody else, Charles Darwin, any leader of a religion. And Charles Darwin was one of the leaders of the evolution religion. But uh, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you say, I, I believe in him. Why? He died and he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, according to what the Bible says. You say, well, whoa, hold on a second here. Uh, I heard that the Bible has contradictions in it. Well, absolutely. The Bible is filled with contradictions if you don't rightly divide it. You say, huh? Well, so you're not going to get a lot of this if you're lost, but you can look at the Old Testament and you can see they're sacrificing animals and they're going out to war and all kinds of stuff. You get to the New Testament, no animals being sacrificed and, and love your enemies. Well, that's a contradiction. That doesn't make any sense. Well, you rightly divide things. You see, a New Testament was brought in by Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. The death of the testator talks about in Hebrews chapter 9. All right, that's what's going on there. And you say, but I, I heard these different things and whatever. Let me tell you something. I have never seen a real, real contradiction that's not a dispensational type of a thing. I've never actually seen a real contradiction. Never. And I never will. 
in the King James Bible anyhow, because the King James Bible is God's perfect word, God's perfect book. And there's the scholars out there, you know, they've, they've answered all these supposed contradictions and things. And, um, you know, but people try to come up with contradictions. Why? Well, because they're trying to say that the Bible's not true so that they can continue in sin, which is insanity when you realize what sin is. Sin is negative. All right? So, I'm uh, going to be connecting to another trail here. This is now ITS 83. I'll get back to talking here about salvation in just a minute. Whoa. <laughs> Almost wiped out. So, <clears throat> getting back to salvation, um, your faith has to come in with the Bible. And again, you know, I'll get people and they'll say, well, Brother Brian, I, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need to change some things and, and whatever. And, and I, I've done what the Bible says to be saved. But, you know, I, I don't know if I'm really saved. Well, here's the thing. What are you putting your faith in? You say, well, Jesus Christ. Okay. But faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, what you need to do is you need to say that King James Bible, that's God's book. I know it's God's book. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, uh, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. You see that? You need to know that you have eternal life, but it only comes from having a written record. You see, a legal document, if I get pulled over by a police officer, and, um, and he says to me, Sir, he says, I, is that your motorcycle? I say, Yes, sir, it certainly is. He says, Okay, I'm going to need to see the registration. License and registration. He said, well, just take my word for it, buddy. I, I, you know, I own the bike. He says, I'm going to need to see the registration. I need to see proof. I need to see written proof that that bike is yours. Well, so it is with salvation. You need to be able to show written proof that you're saved. Okay? And if you can't show that written proof, well, what are you basing it on? Feelings? Well, feelings come and go. Feelings change. What you need to do is you need to say, I am saved. I am born again because of the written record of God's Word. I have faith that the King James Bible is God's perfect book. Not, well, it's a good translation, but probably eventually we should update it. No, 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 no. It's God's perfect Word. Inspired. True. You know? And that's why a lot of people are confused about salvation, and they don't have an assurance of salvation, because it goes back to the thing of not really knowing for sure uh, or excuse me, not really knowing, you know, they, they're confused about their salvation. I just looked down at something there. They're confused about their salvation because they have their beliefs on the King James Bible mixed up. You know? Um, uh, there in uh, Peter, I think First Peter, it says about uh, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You say, well, liveth, that has to be the manifest word, Jesus Christ the capital word, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, that's talking about him because it's liveth. Uh, no, actually in context you read it, it's talking about the written word. It's a lowercase w. The written word of God is living. It liveth and abideth forever. Right? So you say, well, I, I, I'm just not sure. Okay, then get your beliefs on the King James Bible figured out. Alright? I'm sure that I'm the owner of this motorcycle. Why? Because I have written documentation at home to prove it. I can show it. I have the documentation to say that I paid for this book, or this bike, excuse me, and uh, it's mine. All right? Well, the written record that you have of your salvation, your birth certificate, so to speak, is your King James Bible. You can claim the promises in that book. You can put your faith in that book and say, you know what? I can't see Jesus dying on the cross. I can't see, you know, the events of the crucifixion. But I can see what it says in this book, and I believe this book. Okay, that's the important thing there. That's what will give you assurance of salvation. I know a lot of young believers will, you know, struggle with that. And they say, you know, I, I just, I, I'm sure, I, I think I got saved, but I just, ah, I don't know. And I'm just, I'm scared and, and whatever. Um, you need to get that thing sorted out. 
And one of the big things that false prophets and false teachers will do is they'll say, well, of course you're saved. Don't even think about it. Don't even question it. Just just forget about it. You're saved. You're in. You're just, you know, you've believed, haven't you? Of course. Then, okay, then you're, you're in. Well, you need to think about that. You need to be careful about that. So, that is salvation. Coming to God as a sinner and putting your faith in the written word of God and saying, that book says I can be saved if I, if I believe by faith that Jesus died for my sins and he was buried and then he rose again the third day. And that's it. And when you do that, uh, you say, what about baptism? Well, baptism is fine. Baptism shows that, you know, it's kind of a... Oh, oh man. Didn't see that coming. Well, so much for keeping my feet dry, eh? Ugh. What fun is dirt riding if you can't get your feet wet occasionally? That used to be actually be a lake right there. I was a beaver that had dammed it up, but anyhow. Oh man, I'm soaked now. <laughs> oh yeah. This trail system here goes for just miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. And um There used to be a huge big mud puddle here somewhere. But, um, I'll get back to what I was saying here in just a minute. <laughs> but, uh, I just want to answer a couple of things quickly here. Oh, the thing about baptism. Okay, let me, let me finish up on that. Um, getting baptized is okay, but it's not necessary for salvation. It's just more of an outward ordinance where you say, you know, I'm just doing this thing to show that I, my old man is dead. I'm not, I'm not going to live like I used to live, um, which is fine. It's a, it's a good thing to do. Uh, not going to keep you out of heaven or anything if you don't do it. But you know, I think it's important to do. Uh, man. So, um, let me think what else I wanted to talk about. Um, some of the things that people will say to you that go from, you know, to church buildings and whatnot. They say, you know, well, if you're not there at a church building, you know, how are people going to hear the truth and whatever else? Oh, please. Um, people can get online. People can find. There's so many books. There's so many videos. There's so much stuff. You know, and, and of course, you know, that's all just a little bit of a lie, too, you know. You have to be there to tell people the truth. You can't tell people the truth. They're there, you know, they got all the church programs and mow the, who's mowing the yard this week and the, who's vacuuming the sanctuary and the whole thing and, you know, who's going to be there for nursery and Sunday school and, you know, VBS and the whole deal, you know, yeah. Okay, but it's it's just oh man, you just you can't miss it and all this stuff, um, just nonsense. And of course they'll say that you know well see if you don't go to church you're you're uh, deceitful and you're you're just hanging out with the people that you want to hang out with. You're not accountable. Blah blah blah. This is interesting. A truck on the ATV trail. Hmm. That's not really supposed to be. But uh, I was gonna blow by this guy here. I don't know what the deal is. So, um, but you know, they'll, they'll say this thing, oh, you're deceitful and whatever else, and yet the whole time they don't associate with certain churches either. They don't associate with certain people in their own church building. Don't even talk to me about it. You know, you go to these church buildings and the pastor has his favorite people, his in crowd, and you know, the whole deal. Of course they do. Of course they do. <laughs> you know, this just nonsense. But, uh, you know, as time goes by, I think that more and more real real Christians are going to just say, you know what, I've had enough of that. There's a potato harvesting machine. 
a lot of potatoes up here in Aroostook County. But uh, a lot of people are just going to say, I've had enough of this church building stuff. And, um, you know, I'd like to see more Christians getting involved in, in meeting in their homes and, and just meeting with each other and, and going out and doing some tracting together and, and whatever and studying the Word together. I think that that's important. Uh, it's, a, it's a much more intimate thing. You get Christians together that way. And, uh, you know, well, you say, what about church authority? What about church authority? Well, what are they doing in the first century? Again, you know, what about, what about the first century? What about the Bible? You know, let's bring the Bible back into this whole thing, you know. Back to the Bible. I thought we were supposed to do that. You know, I certainly hope that people want to be back to the Bible. And not back to Baptist tradition, you know. If it's in the Baptism, then it's okay. Uh, wrong. Well, we're just about back to the place here in Bridgewater. So, if you've stayed with me for the whole thing, well, congratulations. That's about probably an hour and a half of me ranting and uh, <laughs> talking about things. Can't exactly turn anywhere in my Bible right now because I uh, don't have it with me and be a little bit windy for that. So, oh boy. Well, I guess I'm going to be signing out here soon. Uh, just about back now on the uh, ITS trail system here. Certainly is a blast to ride this thing. And, um, you know, just want to say too, there's absolutely nothing wrong with Christian enjoying themselves like this. You know, don't be covetous. Don't have to have the best and whatever else. This thing here is 18 years old. Old bike. Didn't pay very much for it. You can have still have a great time. Still got my old motorcycle riding gloves on from many years ago, probably 10 or so years ago. But uh, enjoy yourself, brethren, and uh, study the Word. Stay in the Word. So that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.